mentioned it last week, we are at the end of our series and our, our parables. I hope you enjoy it and uh, we had a great time studying uh, the parables and uh, we enjoy it. Um, we are uh, thank you guys for the for scripture reading. Uh, we are now at the, uh, Luke chapter 18. Uh, you can take your Bible and follow with me. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 9. Luke 13, Curtin. Thank you, brother. Uh, Luke 13, verses 1 to 9. So, uh, in, the, in the past month, we, we have struck by the floods in the British Columbia, and uh, probably you all have seen it. Um, where people in a few minutes today, they have lost everything. Uh, when uh, killer tornadoes and storms swept their neighborhoods. So um, we heard earthquakes uh, that killed thousands in other countries, the tragedies in Afghanistan, and now we get nightly report on, on the new COVID variant. Uh, it's uh, so terrible. Um, not only have been catastrophes uh, so alarming that the blood chills by just thinking about it, but newspapers have been devoted uh, to calamities after calamities. We have seen that in, in the news. And add all together, we, uh, it, it's, it's enough. It's enough to shock our mind with uh, the fearful amount of uh, sudden death which has fallen on the sons of men. As such things have, have always happened in all ages of the world. And I do not think is, uh, it's a new thing, and all that is the produce of our modern civilization. And this has always happened in all ages. And on a personal level, uh, many of us uh, struggle with uh, private tragedies, uh, loved one who died untimely deaths, accidents that leave uh, devastating consequences, and children who suffer from birth defects or serious uh, disease. And again, don't think it's a it's a it's an age it's an age that uh, uh, which God is dealing with with us more harshly than of old. Don't think that God's providence has come softer than it was. So there are always were sudden deaths and there always will be. Deaths can take us at any time and anywhere. So we usually hear people talking about living on borrowed time. A pretty common expression, living on borrowed time. So we use it to describe who, uh, somebody who has survived uh, a major heart attack in which they might fell, have died. They might well have died. And we say after, we, and we say after the survival, he or she is living on borrowed time or someone who went through uh, terminal cancer, a uh, case of cancer, went through the, the treatment and is, is still surviving, and we say they are living on borrowed time. And what we mean by that is that somebody is alive and who should be dead. And by all means, if things were sort of normal, those people, they should be dead. But they are, they are alive, and that's what we call borrowed time. So, however, we use it uh, to, to speak of those who should be dead, but, but are not. But when, when we think about it, it's, it's, when we reflect about it, it's all of us. Because the Bible says, uh, uh, the Bible is really clear, the wages of sin is death. We should all be dead. And since the moment we were conceived, we were conceived with a sin nature. And the Psalmist put it uh, this way uh, in Psalm 51, 
Trudia was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And he wasn't talking about an Ill illegitimate birth. He was talking about his nature at the very conception for being a sinful nature. So we could have died at any time. We could have died uh, when uh, we were uh, children. As a children, we could have died. So we are all live. Uh, we are all uh, we, we are all living on borrowed time. So we never know when the tower uh, is going to fall on us. When some calamities is going to take us, or uh, when we might be the victims of some outrageous act of slaughter, such as when the soldiers of Pilate came into the temple and slaughtered the, the Galileans, or what illness may catch us. So we don't know when calamity may befall us. So naturally, we ask, we always ask, why? Why does that? Why this have to uh, happen to that person? Why this? Why did this have to happen to this one and, and the, this girl or this lady or this man? Uh, perhaps the victim is a good is a good person. He was a good man. He was a good. He was a good, uh, a loving dad. But meanwhile, and we think we see uh, people wicked, wicked people who live in a relative happiness and prosperity. We question God's goodness and fairness. Sometimes we even doubt his existence. And it's the classic philosophical comments of evil. How can an all good and powerful God let people, good people, to suffer and wicked people to prosper. So what kind of God lets this happen? And then Christmas is coming, and usually is the time that uh, we have family reunion, we have family gatherings. You probably will get those those questions and uh, you know philosophical questions, philosophical discussion with your uh, the family gatherings. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> let me give you some talk. Uh, to prepare yourself for those kind of questions. Uh, sometimes you will, you will probably hear people will say, why God, a loving God, let COVID happen? Why did not it did not stop it? I have a bad news and a good news for you this morning. The bad news is we all should be dead. We got, if we got what we deserved, we'll be in trouble. We all have a debt of sin toward God. If we are aware of our situation, we will be quick to get right before God, before, before Him, before we come into judgment. And the real question is, what kind of God lets us live? What's the reason we have been kept alive? And the answer is, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has pleaded for you and me. The crucified Savior has interfered for us. Why? Because he has an interest in us all. He pleaded not with his mouth only, but with, with his pierced hands, with his pierced feet and pierced side. And those prevailing sin please have moved the heart of God and we have been kept alive. God is so gracious and is merciful and is compassionate towards sinners and he calls him to hold back what we deserve. I believe that the most universal gift, the most universal blessing that comes from God comes grace to humanity is time. Time to repent, time to believe, and time to time granted by God's grace. He is patient because he's merciful. And this is the good news. We will have the commercial ad, so we will go through the the parable 
and uh, to study uh, our power this morning in three headings. First, we will see the context, and as Daily mentioned last week, always the context, the context, and to see in which uh, uh, context Jesus gave this parable, and then we will uh, study the parable in itself and draw some applications from this story. In the context, at the end of chapter 12, Jesus has been rebuking the crowd because they were able to discern the weather, but they were oblivious, unaware to the signs of times, namely that the Messiah, the Messiah was in their midst. Jesus used an illustration of a man who was going to drive, to be driving to court with a losing lawsuit against him. If he's smart, he will quickly settle with his opponent before it's too late. The point is, we are all have a debt of sin toward God. If we are aware of our situation, as I said before, we will be quick to get right with God before we come into judgment. And then in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 13, Luke reports on the same occasion, on the same occasion, some were present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood had, had mingled with their sacrifices. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. We don't know any more about that, about that event than is here reported. Apparently, Pilate, Pilate sent his, uh, uh, his troops to break up, to break up a gathering of Galilean Jews that he deemed dangerous. The Roman soldiers did not even respect the fact that the Jews were worshiping God by offering sacrifices. They slaughtered them so that their blood flowed with, uh, together with the blood of their sacrifices. And Jesus uses this current event to make a spiritual point. And those who were the bearers of, uh, of, of this bad news viewed it through their own perspective. A perspective which differed which are from our Lord's perspective. And Jesus' response to them exposed both their thinking and the error it betrayed. They had already drawn a false conclusion, and these Galileans were greater sinners than others. And the false conclu conclusion was based on upon a faulty assumption. One's suffering in life is indicative of one's sin, and just one's prosperity is proportional to one's godliness. False conclusion. And Jesus rejected that. And Jesus rejected both the conclusion and its assumption as being false. And he asked the question which he answered with a simple and emphatic no. No. Then he immediately changed the focus. The tragedy which befell those Galileans should not be viewed as an opportunity to, to, to judge those who died at the end of Pilate to be great sinners. Instead, it should be, it should, it should be perceived as a warning to all sinners namely themselves, of the judgment which awaits them. Then he brings, he brings up another tragedy from recent history, something that had just happened, a tower, in verse 4, tower uh, fell down and killed 18 people. And this would have been uh, a headlines in, in the Jerusalem Gazette, if, they, if there was one. If there were, if there was one, so uh, and Jesus used that event to reinforce again the spiritual lesson, and then we may conclude that 
while the first group, this, uh, notice that the first group of men who died were those from Galilee, and the second group seems to be those who lived in Jerusalem. And if these Jerusalemites tended to look down their noses to see, you know, uh, uh, the Galileans, uh, we are better than you, and Jesus will, will provide them with, a, uh, with an example of their own peers dying in a similar way, tragically, prematurely, unexpectedly. While they compared Galileans with themselves, Jerusalem actually compared Galileans to themselves, what Jesus did, Jesus compared Galileans with Galileans and Jerusalemites with Jerusalemites. Verse 4. And so remember, he was speaking to men who did not apply spiritual truth to themselves. So from his reply, we can clearly see that these men were quietly thinking that, you know what, uh, those who were who suffered some such such tragedies were deserving of God's judgment, of God's wrath. So whereas the fact that they had been spared such tragedies meant that they were pleasing to God. And their theology was like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Job Confortus, who thought that Job was suffering because he had sinned. And their question, <laughs> their question was, how could this happen? Our theology said uh, bad things only happen to bad, bad people. How can this be? Are those worse than everybody else in Galilee? That's what they are thinking. They are thinking that, you know, because that happened to them is, be is because they, they were greater sinners. And Jesus corrects this mistaken view by showing that we are all sinners worthy of God's judgment. And twice, Jesus uh, drives from the application where those who suffered greater sinners. And he said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he tells them, you know, since death and judgment are imminent, you need to be ready to true repentance. And he's not speaking in uh, of sufferings in general terms, but specifically of death. So I would like to I would like you to notice our Lord's method here uh, to make his point. He could have used uh, this, this occasion to launch into a critic of Pilate's cruel ways. So he could he say, you know, uh, Pilate is so cruel, he's a cruel man. He did not. He did not do that. He, he, he would. He would have missed the opportunity to uh, teach them a spiritual lesson. He would have missed the spiritual opportunity. And also, he could jump into a philosophical discussion of evils, of, of the problem of evils. But his hearers would have gone away on change. Instead, uh, the Lord took this general topic to teach them and to focus it on the consciences of, of those who had raised that subject. He applies them twice, then he further drives them home with the power. So philosophic uh, discussions are fairly, are, fairly, are fairly safe, but Jesus turned such discussions into personal need for repentance. So he always had in view the need of sinful souls before the Holy God. So should we. Then Jesus tells a parable that underscores the prayer. If you don't repent, you will soon face God's judgment. So he began to, he began telling this parable in the verse 6. So we have a man, and by the way, uh, as we always 
uh, say it, a parable is, is, uh, is an um, illustration. It's not an allegory. It, uh, we, don't, we don't have to parallel it uh, in all parts to some reality, to some other reality. It's a, just a story. Uh, basically, it has one purpose and one meaning. It's a, uh, an uh, illustration. So we began in verse 6. Uh, then it, he told this parable, a man, a certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. Now, uh, that's a pretty common thing in Israel. Vineyards were very, very common. They still, they still uh, are in Israel, and it was an agricultural society. And Jesus, therefore, thought in many agricultural uh, metaphors, analogies, and illustrations, parables, because everybody understood it. Fig trees were very common in Israel, very valuable. In fact, way back in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8, in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, even back in Micah chapter 7, verse 1, uh, refers to the fig tree being a symbol of God's blessing. It was not only a land of milk and, hun and honey, it was a land of vineyards and fig trees. So fig trees grew to a height of 25 feet and sometimes the width of 20 feet. They were full kind of dense trees and the fruit was like a small plum or, or a large cherry in its size. They not only provided fruit every single year, and they flourished in the land of Israel when they were, were only uh, when they were taken care of well. But they also were great shade trees because of the density of and the size. In fact, it was Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel remember uh, when Jesus said to him, uh, uh, he, Nathaniel was sitting. Uh, under the fig tree, uh, which is uh, where we, we sat on a, on a hot day to get some shade. And, uh, and John chapter 8, verse uh, 48, uh, Jesus said that it was an excellent place to gather and collect. And Jesus saw him in the, under the fig tree. And it was very, uh, pretty typical in Israel that vineyards were, were, the, were the hardest. They gave great attention to prepare the ground properly. It was protected, guarded, watered, and fertilized. It was just a, it was just a perfect place to plant the fruit the fruit tree. So very common, very uh, so very commonly, and you find it in a number of places in the Bible. They planted the fruit trees in the, in the same soil where the vineyard was, and that was that what that what uh, uh, that that's what happened here in uh, look in, in our parable this morning, and then we also we can read a Micah chapter four verse four, and you will see illustrations of that. There are others as well, and as and as as would be understood by everybody. This man had a fig tree which had been planted by him or somebody else. It had, it had been there a while, and he came looking for fruit on it, and he didn't find any. And this was unexpected. In verse 7. And the fig trees did very well. It did very well, and they uh, particularly would do very well in vineyard soil because of its constant care. So this was a great disappointment, a great disappointment manifest in verse 7. And he said to the vineyard owner, uh, the vineyard keeper, the gardener, behold, in some translations, behold, that's a word that indicates surprise, behold, this is not expected. Three years have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. It's useless. Now, this is not a, some technical assessment 
of the negative impact of, of, of a fruitless, uh, uh, fruitless uh, uh, tree on the grounds resources for the vineyard. That is to say, it's not saying, it's not saying, you know, uh, is, is using water, is using the ground, and uh, the, the vineyard could use. It didn't say that. It didn't say it's using nutrients the vineyard could use. This is an expression of disgust. I mean, why does it, why does it even use the ground? Cut it down. It's useless. There's a level of irritation, of disgust, of justifiable anger, because it's fruitless, it's useless. And they would understand that those who are listening that day. But here comes uh, the prayer in verse 8. Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. The vineyard keeper Answered that, and so he said to him, "Let it alone, sir. Let it alone. Don't cut it down. And for this year too, let it alone until I dig it. I dig around it and put it uh, as some fertilizer. Would you give this tree one more shot? Just give one more opportunity to do that. To do what I've always done every year with this tree." This isn't like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this. I've never done it before. It doesn't say that. One more shot. One more opportunity. And this year also, he says, in, all, in every other year, I will do that. And he was a faithful guy in the story. He was taking care of this man's crop. Let me dig. Let me loosen the soil, which I read the ground and allows the water to get into it. And let me fertilize it. Put some down and manure on it. I've done it all along. And then in verse 9, if it bears fruit next year, fine. And if it not, cut it down. That's the end of the parable. The dramatic ending. Cut it down. And he did not cut it down. What would they be thinking of? John the Baptist, chapter 3, down at, at the weaver, uh, talking about the Messiah, coming and saying, you better bring fruits fit for repentance, because the axe is already laid at the root of the tree. Luke chapter 3, verse 9. The decree has already done cut it. Cut it down. The axe is laid at the root of the tree, ready for the first blow. <clears throat> Hold that axe for a minute. And the gardener is pleading, Hold that axe for a minute. Just one opportunity. Could you give that tree a little borrowed time? In the original text, it doesn't even say next year, but it says literally in the coming time. I don't know how long that time will be. In the coming time, it's often ended. In the coming time, please, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading you to give this tree just one more time. Now let's look at some applications that come out from the story. First, to a nation and then to individuals. Because the tree is a solitary tree, it has individuals' applications. And the three, uh, the three, the three entities in the story all have clear symbolic significance. The vineyard owner represents God, the one who rightly uh, expects to see fruit on his tree, and who justly decides to destroy it when he finds none. The gardener or the vineyard keeper who cares for the trees, watering or fertilizing them to bring them to the peak of the fruitfulness, represents Jesus who feeds his people and gives it them living water. The tree itself has two symbolic, two symbolic meanings, the nation 
the nation of Israel and the individual. As the story unfolds, we see the vineyard owner expressing his disappointment at the fruitless tree. He has looked for fruit for three years from this tree, but has found none. The three year period is significant. It's significant because for three years, John the Baptist and Jesus have been preaching the message of repentance throughout Israel. But the fruit of repentance were not forthcoming. John the Baptist warned the people about the Messiah coming and told them to bring fruit fit for repentance because the axe was already laid at the, at the root of the, tree, of the tree. In Luke chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. And because the Jews were offended by the idea they needed to repent, and they rejected the Messiah because he demanded repentance from them. And after all, they had everything. They had some time. They had the revelation of God. They had the prophets, the scriptures, the covenant, and the adoption. They had some time. They had some time before his death. They even had some time before the destruction, the destruction of their nation, the city. They had it all. But they rejected the Messiah. They had departed from the true faith and the true living God and created a system of works righteousness that was an abomination to God. He, as a vineyard owner, was perfectly justified in tearing down the tree that had no fruit. The Lord's axe was all, already poised over them, over the woods of the tree, and it was ready to fall. So however, we see the gardener pleading here for a little more time. They were a few months before the crucifixion. And, and, and more miracles to come, especially the incredible uh, miracle uh, of, of Lazarus, of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which will astound many Jews, many and perhaps cause the Jews to repent, but they did not. As, as, as it turned out, Israel as a nation still did not believe, but individuals certainly did. The compassionate gardener intercedes for more time to water, to fertilize the fruitless, the fruitless tree. The gracious Lord of the vineyard responds in patience. And for the individual, the comparison of a man to a tree is exceeding, exceedingly common in scripture uh, because it's more natural and appropriate. As fruit is, production, is the production of a tree, so obedience to the divine will and holiness unto the Lord should be the product of man's life. And for it, he was first created. When men plant trees in a vineyard, they very naturally expect to find fruit on them. It's very natural. Very natural. When you uh, plant a tree and you, you when you go and uh, every year, you expect to have some fruit from your trees. They find, but when they find no produce, the natural and justifiable expectation is disappointment. Even thus, speaking of a manner after the manner of men, it's natural that the great maker of all look for the good fruit and obedience and love from the men who are the objects of his providential care. And he grieves when he meets no return, when he meets with no return. 
Man is a very much more God's property than a tree can ever be the property of, of a man who plants a vineyard. And the more reasonable that his most uh, righteous requirements should be not be refused. Trees that bear no fruit must be cut down, and sinners who bring no repentance, faith, and holiness must die. Even one of us, every, every one of us has something to do with Jesus Christ. Those who have no spiritual fruit will be judged. If there will be, if there is no spiritual life, no spiritual fruit in us, it will, it will cut us down. And if there is no spiritual life in you that comes only through Jesus Christ, only through the faith in Jesus Christ, you will be cut down and cast into fire, as John the Baptist put it. That's eternal punishment. To cut us down, I mean, fair difference, to cut us down would be the most appropriate, reasonable thing to do. If you reflect on that, that is the, sh the shortest and the surest way to deal with us. Because we are all missed God, God's target. As I, I, as I said it, um, in our, the, our Bible study this week, for we are all have seen and fall short of the glory of God. When the owner of the vineyard says to the gardener concerning the, the tree, cut it down, the treatment is very sharp, but it's very simple. The fanning is soon done, and the, and the clearance is rigorous. And whenever, when whatever tree is planted, the benefit is evident. To dig, to dig about the tree, to trench it, to trench it, to feed it, to prune, to water it, all this is a long affair. You can ask our gardening expert, Anita, she will tell you how gardener is, uh, gardening is, is hard. Without requiring, uh, requiring care, labor, attention. And while after all that, the process may fail and loss, labor may be lost. To spare is difficult and involves trouble. To cut us down is easy and effectual. No longer will a long-suffering God be wearied with our sins and pressed up down under the load of our iniquities. To cut us down is the most reasonable when we consider the order and the other trees. So it's like money invested bringing Bringing in no interest. If you have money invested in the bank and you don't have any interest, it's a, it's a dead loss. How, how you can have money and you that money didn't bring any interest? What is the use of keeping it? The dead tree is neither useful nor ornamental. It can yield no service and afford no pleasure. Cut it down by all means. Friends, we live in daily disobedience against God, who alone can do, can do good to us. When we think we have given to God such a bad return, when he must have received so much better, how much you must, we must provoke him. We have been guilty of very provoking sins. We cursed, we swear, and, and by the way, I've, uh, I've told someone the other day, and, I, and you can see that I've never seen someone when he failed to do some, something, and he says, uh, oh my Buddha, oh my, you know, and she will, or he will always say, oh my, oh gee. 
And uh, that provoked her. You, we use his name in vain. That, that there cannot be any pleasure in pronouncing or any more than expressing any other form of words. It's just because man will hate his maker and, will, and he will provoke him. We slander, we lie, we, we do bad, we offend God. And don't think uh, the time is granted us is due to our worthiness. When he says, why should it even occupy the ground? He's saying in disgust. And God has every right to be disgusted with us as sinners. Every right. Why, why does he even leave? Why does she even leave? That's the disgust of God. And it's not that we are better than the people who, who the tower fell, or we are better than the people who killed by pilots or soldiers, or the people who died in a calamity, or got cancer, or heart diseases, or whatever it is, we are not any better. We are not any different. We are sinners. And God is not sparing us because he's insensible towards sinners, towards our sins. He's angry, he's angry with the wicked every day, but he cannot endure iniquity. All day long, his anger smokes and burns towards evil, and yet he holds back the, the thunderbolt and does not strike the guilty. If you, had a bad, if, you, if you had been angry for half an hour, you would have come to hard words, but here, he is the judge of all the earth, angry every day, anywhere from your 20 to 80 years from, uh, with some of you, and he has not destroyed us, he has not destroyed you. He said to the foolish rich, uh, rich man, this night your soul should be required of you, and he never saw the money. And he might have easily have sent us the same message, the same sad, sad message. What then? As I, as I have said earlier, this great patience is not manifested towards our sinful soul because Lord is all dependent on us. Our living and our dying will not diminish his glory. A God so good and so gracious must have been loved by us. He has treated, he has treated us so well and given us such capacities to enjoy life that he must have had some service of us. Nothing can be so much yours as you are God's. We should have served him, to have delighted in him, delighted in that service, to spend and to have spent for our Lord. He asked no more than he must have had. And yet, and yet he asked us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And this what was with the first and great commandment. But this we have constantly, persist, persistently broken. We have not been cut down because Jesus is. We have not. We, we have not been cut down. Why? Because Jesus is the one who pleads for sinners. However, remember, our time is not permanent. God's patience is not permanent. These prayers are easy to understand in this little story. The tree is a solitary tree. It's a nation, but, but it's an individual. If we have no fruit, we will be cut down. We are all living in our time. Judgment is near. And there is nothing about us that earns that borrowed time. So it's purely at the merciful discretion of God that we leave another day. So in the parable, the vineyard owner grants another year of life to the tree. 
In the same way, God, in his mercy, grants us another day, another hour, another blink. Christ stands at the door of each man's heart, knocking and seeking to gain entrance and requiring repentance for sin, from sin. But if there is no fruit, no repentance, his patience will come to an end, and the fruitless, unrepentant individual will be cut down. And that is why the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7, he said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while, while he is, in, is in near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man is thought. Let him return to the Lord, and you will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. And this week, uh, you probably received something in your brother than I uh, uh, discovered a, a beautiful song. I would like you, I would like you to, to read it and to, uh, I, I would read it for you. I found the word of so powerful, and it says, To grace you a sinner like me, I don't understand how a God so divine could lower himself to a life such, a, such as mine, and consider me worth every minute of time to rescue a sinner like me. When I think of my Savior alone on the cross, I know without him that my life would be lost if he had not been willing to suffer the cost to rescue a sinner like me. To rescue a sinner like me, to rescue a sinner like me, he abandoned his throne and his kingdom above to rescue a sinner like me. My mind is so limited that I cannot see the reason he died and he arose just for me. So unworthy was I, yet he gave willingly to rescue a sinner like me. To rescue a sinner like me, as worthless as I, yet he gave me a reason to sing. It's hard to believe, but he happened to me. Hallelujah to Jesus, my King. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of salvation, and we pray that we might be received eagerly by many, even this day. We pray that we will cause us to love you in a greater way, understanding your grace to us in your son. Thank you for your compassion, thank you for your patience that waited for us to come and to wait for sinners even today. May they respond and may be grateful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.